the focus is on Islamist extremism. So how far away are we from a French-style assimilation? This verdict is to giving us a taste of how extremism is going to be understood in the coming years. If we accommodate Muslim practice, what we are doing is we are watering down, we are not upholding, we are not sustaining Western values. There is a political will to make sure that Islam is managed, it's contained. British schools teach Muslim pupils to be inferior. That we need to imitate the West in order to be modern. That Muslim life can be bombed, can be droned, can be tortured, it can be displaced, it can be um, extradited, detained without charge. Schools in the UK uphold supremacy. The recent verdict in the UK High Court over the Michaela School Prayer Row, where a schoolgirl wished to pray the Muslim prayer during her school breaks and even disallowed in the playground, can illustrate a challenge for Muslims in Western societies. How do we navigate our commitments, our obligations towards our religion as parents and at the same time create an environment where our children succeed? Many Muslims are today asking the question, are schools a hostile place for Muslims? There is a growing feeling that British schools are hostile to Muslim pupils. Today we have Dr. Amina Sharif, Assistant Professor in Education at Goldsmiths University of London. She has pursued a Master's in Education as well as completed a PhD at the Faculty of Education at Cambridge University. Her research focuses on education, anti-Muslim racism and the impact of the war on terror on young Muslim women. Dr. Amina Sharif, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to The Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for having me. Well, it's wonderful to have you with us. Now, we're reflecting on uh, a few days after that Michaela school verdict. Can you maybe bring us up to speed on the verdict and um, uh, the impact you think it will have on the Muslim community? Sure. So the story goes that you have a case of a young woman in school who wants to pray, right? And she simply wants to pray not during, you know, lesson time. She wants to pray during lunchtime, for example. She takes this case to her school and her school refuses um, to allow her to pray. Mm. And um, so her parents sort of escalate the situation yeah. and they get legal advice, legal support on this issue. This case then goes to court. And the conclusion is that um, the courts ruled that the school was within its rights to not allow this student um, time in school to pray. Now, the way I interpret this verdict um, is that it is going to, or it portends what is to come in this country with regards to the latest prevent and with regards to the latest extremism uh, law. So we know that the new PREVENT that was released in 2023, yeah. um, it takes a shift in uh, focus away from extremism, the way it's understood it historically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to a focus on Islamist extremism, right. right? And so there's a difference now in the latest version of, of PREVENT in that the focus is on Islamist extremism. Right. Now, Islamist extremism has been, of course, identified as the ideology that leads to the commission of political violence and the prevent policy documents reference um, Islamist extremism as this kind of ideology that desires, um, that, that uses violent means to install like a caliphate or a political order. Yes. So this is how Islamism is sort of being understood in the UK as this political project that seeks to supplant Western values mm. in the West itself or in the UK itself, yes. right? And my perspective on this construction of Islamism is that it really resembles the Arabian discourses, right? So the Arabian discourses are these discourses that raise alarm about this impending white genocide that Europe is turning into Arabia, and yeah. it's going to be sort of colonized into this outpost of the Islamic world, right? But this, this fear of political Islam in this, in this country, yeah. in, in terms of how it's articulated by certain segments of the political establishment, resembles, right, the narrative structure 
of these Arabian conspiracy theories. You have a political project that's seeking to supplant Western values and therefore turn uh, the UK into some kind of caliphate, right? Yes. To my understanding, there is no political project in this country that has those objectives in mind. Perhaps there are projects in the Muslim majority countries that seek that. And of course, in those contexts, um, political Islam is a viable or it is a perfectly legitimate political project, right? And we could talk about political Islam uh, later if we need to. But my point is that with this focus on Islamist extremism in the new prevent, this Michaela verdict tells us what Islamist extremism means for the new prevent, right? Yeah. Policy Exchange, its published reports, describing Islamism as multicultural accommodation. And Policy Exchange is? It's a conservative you know, think tank mm. that um, is very supportive of Prevent and a lot of policies that right. make life difficult in the UK for British Muslims. Yes. The way political Islam is constructed is that it's multicultural accommodation. In other words, whenever you see public sector institutions, schools, universities, workplaces that are accommodating Muslim practices, for example, by allowing the hijab, allowing the prayer, um, giving some kind of um, leeway when it comes to Ramadan and so on and so forth, the Jumu'ah prayer. Yes. Th- this segment of the political establishment is saying, look, this is an expression of political Islam. Right. And we have seen this also in the Trojan horse affair, right? We had schools in Birmingham that were accommodating Muslim faith practices and they were identified as Islamist. So this verdict is to giving us a taste of how extremism is going to be understood in the coming years. And that's my interpretation, at least, right? Yeah. But, but it seems like, um, I mean, that's quite a leap, right? Because, of course, uh, all this young uh, Muslim girl wanted to do is, is conduct her prayers. Sure. And as far as I understand it, you know, it's perfectly accepted uh, that... Um, you know, people have the right to undertake their religious obligations. Like, what is the connection between conducting a religious obligation and a caliphate? Sure. Like, what, what comes in between that? So the way religious practice is being understood is mm. that it is the undermining of Western values, right. right? If we accommodate Muslim practice, what we are doing is we are watering down we are not upholding, we are not sustaining Western values, right? Oh. Or the values on which Britain imagines itself, itself yes. as being predicated. So, so by letting this happen, yeah. we are weakening right, this notion of Britain. And this weakening of Britain is sort of being constructed as what might come if Muslims are allowed this multicultural practice, right? Mm. Or this multicultural accommodation. So I think um, there is, there's definitely a leap that's being made here. Yeah. But that leap is being made by certain you know, political actors who simply want Islam to not have a place publicly um, in Britain. So how far away are we from a French-style assimilation where Islamic practice in public is negated, it's challenged, it's uh, removed from public life. I mean, are you predicting or are you suggesting that uh, Britain, is, Britain is moving in that sort of direction? Definitely. Really? I definitely predict that this is the trajectory that we are on. Really? And the reason why I say this is because we've actually been on this trajectory for a while. Right. Um, prevent and counter extremism has defined extremism as opposition to Western values, right? We know that. Um, that has slightly changed with the new bill on extremism, which now defines extremism as sort of active efforts to uh, supplant a democratic order and to um, negate the rights that are enshrined in a democratic society, right? Yeah. What, what this definition of extremism does mm. is it says anything that doesn't subscribe to look like or you know feel like western values is therefore extremism yeah. right what does that do it's it suggests that the only 
sort of legitimate value system is one that is predicated on liberal thought that's enshrined in, in, in Enlightenment thinking. Yes. Now, that definition itself suggests that there's no other room to be different in this country or express a different set of values, right? So we're already heading then in a direction that is away from multiculturalism and towards this rigid notion of what it means to be Britain, yeah. or sorry, what it means to be British, a rigid notion of what it means to be British. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of police through counter-extremism uh, strategies. But I wonder whether um, this move away from multiculturalism uh, is uh, as pronounced as, as you suggest. I mean, for, for example, we know that the state still funds many Muslim schools, and we know that there are... Um, Muslim charities and Muslim and mosques and mosques are, are growing in number all the time. And you know, if we think about if we compare that to say Paris or compare that to to France or even some of the other European states, there is a a tangible negation of Islamic orthodox practice in society. And so, you know, how do we square that? How do we obs we observe on one level that Islam is encouraged? on some level and you know you have got Rishi Sunak who sends out um, uh, greetings on Eid and and calls people to Downing Street if Tars over no one turns up now but you know how, how then do we square that circle? Well I think we would square it by keeping in mind that Britain is not France and Britain mm. has a very unique sort of colonial um, experience with the Muslim world right. and it's a unique colonial sort of approach to dealing with difference yeah and it's historically dealt with difference through multicultural accommodation where france never took that approach yeah and france as an imperial sort of or sorry britain as this imperial figure this colonial figure has long perfected techniques of counterinsurgency right and those techniques of counterinsurgency are applied on domestic populations to sort of win their hearts and minds so these eid wishes and they're nothing more than hearts and minds operations. But fundamentally, if you look at the conservative party, right, and if you look at the policies in this country and you look at the practice of this policy, of these policies in this country, you can see that there is, um, there is a political will to make sure that Islam is managed, it's contained, it's remade, that Muslim people are remade into, you know, properly British subjects. Mm -hmm. So I think... Um, a lot of what we see in terms of state support for Muslim institutions is very cosmetic. Mm. But underlying this support is a very antagonistic sort of um, vision of Islam in Britain. Now, you argue that uh, British schools uh, teach Muslim pupils to be inferior. And that's quite a controversial statement. How, how does it do that? It's a very controversial statement. And so I think before we answer this question, we take two steps back. Yeah. And we can address the question, what is a school? Hmm. And I know uh, we had this conversation. It might seem like a silly place to start. Yeah. But schools, as we imagine them, are supposed to be safe for children. They're supposed to guarantee their interests. Yeah. Um, our literature and our pop popular culture is full of images of schools as places where children realize themselves and they attain upward social mobility because of schools. Mm. Now, educationalists and people who've had bad experiences with schooling know that this image of schools could not be further from the truth, mm. right? Um, schools, as an educationalist with interests in race and racism, schools, uh, the perspective that I take is that schools are the foundation of any society. They make possible a social, economic, racial, gender order, and so on and so forth. So just to give you an example, schools socialize young people into adults who accept their place in an economic system as docile workers. Um, they learn that they cannot own the means of production, that they have to sell their wages for labor. Uh, schools socialize young people into accepting their place in a political system as part of the electorate instead of future, uh, instead of future MPs and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, crucially for our discussion today, schools also teach and socialize young people into adults who accept the racial terms of, a particular, of this racial order, right? And they 
teach young people their place in this racial order. Mm. So ultimately schools are teaching young people that human beings are organized by races and that these races are have a relationship to each other in a kind of racial hierarchy where there are some races that are superior, advanced, civilized, and there are others that are inferior, um, not advanced, barbaric, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, how? How is the question, yeah. yeah. Because we are led to believe that uh, we live in an equal society and uh, schools are pretty liberal places where um, the values of liberalism uh, are embedded in the minds of, of young pupils. And uh, uh, we regularly um, uh, congratulate one another in, in, in our achievements in, in breaking taboos and breaking barriers and breaking inequalities. Mm -hmm. But your argument is that schools uh, very actively are against that, that type of standard. So how does that happen? What I'm arguing is that we have this common sense understanding of schools, but mm. in fact, schools do a radically different opposite, right? Yeah. And so schools teach young pupils, Muslim pupils in particular, for a yeah. conversation here, their place in a racial hierarchy in yeah. many ways. Yeah. Um, curriculum, interactions with peers, interactions with teachers, and so on and so forth. So if we just take curriculum, okay? What do I mean by curriculum? You have the formal curriculum and the informal curriculum. The formal curriculum is what we might refer to the classes, the subjects that we take, the English, the history, the geography, um, the literature, the languages, uh, architecture, so on and so forth. So let's, if we consider the formal curriculum, what does the curriculum look like in this country? Well, scholars of decolonial thought, post-colonialism have long ask the question, why is my curriculum white, right? Because they have observed that this curriculum that we are taught in this country is very white. What do we learn in English? We learn Anglo-American literature. We learn Western geographies. We learn Western languages, English, French, German, Spanish, so on and so forth. Yeah. We learn Western history. And this history is written by Western historians. Yeah. So what does this white curriculum then do to a brown or Muslim pupil who yes. is going through an educational career with the white curriculum, what it does is it teaches, or it's analogous to a young person looking into a mirror, looking into a mirror and seeing no reflection. In other words, they do not see their culture as you know, a culture that's produced civilization, literature, art, that's produced language that's of any worth, or has produced history. They don't see themselves, they cannot. It's not possible for them to see themselves mm. as uh, makers of history even, right? So what they are seeing, though, is a white curriculum where white people are doing all of those things. So they learn about their racial category and they learn about their racial category in relation to whiteness, right? So in this way, schools, just by the white curriculum, teach Muslim people their place in relation to whiteness and their place on a racial hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, what impact does that have on Muslim children uh, when they interact with this education system? Right. So if you noticed in my language, I made sure to say that this is what schools teach. But what schools teach is still very different from what students learn. Right. right? So some students will learn and accept these terms, while others resist and actively disrupt these terms, uh -huh. right? So there's two possibilities then in response to your question. We can have students who learn their place in a racial order, learn that, they're in, that they are you know, somehow inferior, uncivilized, backwards in relation to whiteness. They learn that they need to become something else. They need to become white. They need to become liberal subjects. Or you could have you know, pupils who who perhaps because at home they've received uh, a different kind of education. Their parents have supplemented the education that they receive at schools. Mm. Um, they are exposed to an Islamic history. They're exposed to Islamic art, perhaps by traveling abroad and you know, just visiting the mosques alone will give you a sense of Muslim contribution to architecture and art, right? Yeah. Students with that kind of history and background will perhaps be reacting differently to this sort of racial curriculum in schools. Right. So I don't want to say that there's one particular impact on students, but what I can say from my own research is that uh, anti-Muslim racism in schools is being expressed 
by young Muslim women, because those are the subjects that I, uh, or the participants that I worked with, mm -hmm. they, they understood that they were being sort of constructed in a particular way. They were being located in a particular racial category. Mm -hmm. They were trying to distance themselves from this racial category by becoming less Muslim, by becoming less visibly Muslim, less vocally Muslim. And for me, I interpret that as not just alienation from school, yeah. but from, I, I interpret that as becoming a different kind of person altogether, of, of being a, a different kind of subject that's animated by a sense of self that's not necessarily rooted in a Quranic worldview or a Sunnah-based worldview. Now, Dr. Amina, um, there have been attempts to not possibly decolonize the curriculum, but certainly attempts to deal with uh, some of these, um, the whiteness in the curriculum. So I've noticed that over the years there have been attempts to maybe include more black history or even Muslim history uh, in uh, history curriculums, history national curriculum, or attempts to um, bring in um, more cultural literature, possibly beyond uh, Anglo-American uh, literature. Um, would you congratulate these attempts? Do you see these attempts to be a move in a positive direction? So my perspective on decolonizing the curriculum is that it's not possible to cosmetically make a significant impact, right? right? When we have Black History Month, mm. where we bring in a few you know, Muslim authors, we talk about Muslim history and so on and so forth, yeah. we are not centering that knowledge and neither are we centering this idea that Muslims are producers or black people are producers of civilization and culture. Mm -hmm. We're simply saying, okay, look, they wrote this poem. Look, they wrote this book. We're reading it. But we're not making any kind of significant shift in our understanding of these racial categories as, as communities, as civilizations that contributed to, to knowledge itself, that contributed to the trappings of civilization, right? Mm. And so for me, it's it's... What we need, or a truly decolonized curriculum, makes a shift in the way we understand who is fully human, right? And who is fully human is predicated on the idea, on the ideas of what they've contributed to civilization. We can't do that unless we really, really come with a radically different kind of curriculum. Yeah, um, I've noticed you've used the term white supremacy when describing um, how schools function. Um, explain that, because it's a loaded term and, and of course, a very controversial term. Um, would, you, would you go as far as to say that there is a, an embedded white supremacy in the, uh, in the British curriculum? Well, white supremacy is often understood as, you know, what white supremacists on the street who are part of these far-right movements yeah. are and do and advocate for. Yeah. We never imagine white supremacy as front and center of society itself and especially in schools. Yeah. So what exactly is white supremacy? Hmm. White supremacy is simply the view that white civilization is the only civilization that has contributed anything of significance, that its values are universal values, mm -hmm. right? Values of rule of such as the rule of law, tolerance, freedom, sexual freedoms, that these are the only ways we can imagine human flourishing and the good life, right? right? When you begin to say that these are the only legitimate ways of imagining human flourishing, yeah. that all social, political, economic, cultural institutions have to look Western in order to be modern, that we need to imitate the West in order to be modern or to to work in or to participate in a global system, yeah. then what we're saying, what you're essentially saying is that whiteness is supreme, right? Whiteness is superior. And that's essentially what white supremacy points out, mm. that this is what is being articulated by these demands to accept Western values as universal mm. and to equate modernization with Westernization. Now in schools, I don't know if we can go into it now, but schools are upholding right, white supremacy through, right. through um, definitions of extremism that they are uh, beholden to watch out for mm -hmm. by the prevent duty. How are British schools uh, a front line 
uh, in the war on terror? My answer to your question connects with the conversation that we just had on white supremacy. Hmm. And I mentioned that schools are beholden to the prevent duty, hmm. which is that schools and other public sector organizations, but schools as well, must watch and surveil and monitor pupils for signs of radicalization. Yeah. And these signs of radicalization um, have been listed in government guidance and documents. But there is a reigning definition here of extremism that is sort of being used to think about what counts as radicalization, mm. right? And that definition of extremism is that is opposition to British values. Of course, that's changed with the new extremism bill. Mm. Now, what does this definition of extremism have to do with white supremacy? Well, this definition of extremism, it defines everything that is not Western values as extremist. It, it's putting everything that is not Western in opposition to Western values. So imagine if you have values. So for example, let's take the rule of law. Yeah. This is sort of touted as a quintessentially Western value. Mm. The rule of law is this notion that law is produced through a democratic process. Yes. What then for a group of people, Muslim people, who believe that law might also be, be, div might also be extracted through divine scripture, mm. that we are not only you know, debating our laws and passing our laws through a particular way, but we have certain laws that we abide by that are divinely sort of uh, enshrined. If we believe that, does that make us extremists? By this definition, it, it, it might, because we're not opposing the rule of law, but we're suggesting, hold on, there might be a way of understanding a rule of law that is not enshrined in enlightenment thinking. Yeah. We are suggesting that maybe the Muslim practice of the rule of law might look something different than a Western practice of the rule of law. And of course, when you have this notion of Western universalism, this notion that Western values apply to across time and space, mm -hmm. there's this expectation that the application of Western values looks like Western cultural, social, political applications. Yeah. We see that with the notions of women's rights, right? Mm -hmm. We, the West, cannot imagine that women might be equal, might be applying the principle of women's equality in a different way, right? Without looking like the West. Mm. But of course, when we don't look like the West, we're immediately sort of identified as extreme. Mm. We're identified as misogynistic, oppressive, anti-civilizational, yeah. right? So clearly we have this case where everything that is not Western is identified as extremism. So what, I, what am I trying to say here? Yeah. I'm trying to say that when you have this oppositional framing, you are upholding the superiority of Western values, right? And if schools are doing that by implementing that definition, yeah. then schools are upholding white supremacy. They are practices of Eurocentrism. And I don't know how we could intellectually interpret schools any differently based on this conversation that we've just had and the way I've unpacked how extremism is understood. So then in your mind, is it impossible for a Muslim to be a liberal subject? Wow, this is a loaded question. <laughs> now, I think, I don't want to suggest that liberal values are in opposition to values that are rooted in a Quranic and a Sunnah-based worldview, mm. right? Because to do so would be to fall into the logic of the clash of civilizations. It would be to give fodder to you know, the far right and the you know, conservatives in the political, on the political spectrum who want Muslims themselves to say that Islamic values are in clash with Western values. But I do want to be very careful here in saying that the Muslim, the way I'm understanding the Muslim as a tawhidic subject, right, is fundamentally still not a liberal subject. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Why am I calling this Muslim subject a tawhidic subject? Because today, the category of Muslim can refer to like a racial category, a political category. It can refer to a cultural heritage. It can refer to like an origin, right? Um, the family that you came from. So 
what I mean by saying a tawhid, what I mean by using the term tawhidic subject is that I want to keep an eagle-eyed focus that this is a subject that is understanding the world yeah. according to the ways the Quran and Sunnah have sort of told us to, to understand the world and that the subject is trying to embody, therefore, what comes when you accept that worldview, right? So this subject is fundamentally different then from a liberal subject whose worldview is enshrined in enlightenment thought, which comes out of efforts to delete religion, erase religion, decenter God and center man, yeah. right? Decenter man such that the purpose and trajectory of life is what? It is the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of freedom. It is the desires and will of that individual that are the basis of life itself and the objective of life itself. Put that in contrast with the tawhidic subject who believes that there is this divine will and that they are actually slaves of God and that they are submitting to a will of God and their agency comes through that submission yeah. as opposed to an agency that is coming out of their will to freedom and happiness. So these are different subjects. I, I believe these are sub different subjects. Mm -hmm. Of course, to say that the Tawhidic subject is different from the liberal subject is not to say that we don't believe in notions of the rule of law or that we don't believe in the notions of tolerance. But again, going back to what I've already said earlier in our conversation, mm -hmm. the way we would sort of enact these values might look differently than the ways in which a Western or a liberal subject might enact those values. Now, um, I can see you, you pick your language very carefully, and so far you've used the term anti-Muslim racism rather than Islamophobia. Sure. Uh, do you object to the use of the term Islamophobia? I don't. Ah. I don't. I don't sub object to the use of the term Islamophobia. I think it's a really important term. Hmm. However... I myself found myself using the term anti-Muslim racism only because I was, uh, through, my, through my education, seeped in the black radical tradition that was coming out of the transatlantic slave trade and the experience of plantation slavery. Right. And the language that is used by, in black studies is this language of racism. And the scholars that I was thinking with were... Um, you know, black scholars. And so one scholar in particular that I, I like to think with is Ruth Gilmore Wilson. And she defines racism as exposure to premature death. And this is something that we could interpret anti-Muslim racism in relation to mm -hmm. anti-Muslim racism is without a doubt, without any question, a racial project that exposes Muslim people to premature death. And this is part of why then I use the term racism more than I do Islamophobia because I'm, my interlocutors are um, scholars who are, who are using the term racism itself. Okay, and um, I, um, um, I've come across a number of uh, Muslim parents who have decided, who've, who probably analyze, uh, maybe not in a sophisticated way you have, but analyze the... Uh, of a British um, system to be education system to be quite hostile to their children, and they've chosen to uh, homeschool uh, their kids. I mean, do you feel that that's the only option available to to Muslim parents now here? Well, full disclosure here. At one point, I also believed that homeschooling homeschooling was an option, and mm -hmm. I actually homeschooled my first son mm -hmm. for for a while while I was doing my PhD. It was the worst decision ever. Don't. Right. <laughs> Don't do that. Yes. Don't homeschool while you're doing a PhD. Yes. But um, homeschooling, it is filled with radical potential. Mm. With radical potential. Radical potential. Wow. Good yeah. potential. Yeah. Radical, not in like dangerous, threatening way, yes. but a transformative potential. Yeah. Right? I'll tell you why I say this. When you're homeschooling, you are disrupting all notions of what counts as an educated person. You are jettisoning all notions of what counts as knowledge itself, mm. right? We already had the conversation. It's only the white history, literature, etc., that counts as knowledge itself that's worth transmitting. As a home educator, you're saying, actually, 
my knowledge counts as knowledge too. Mm -hmm. And my knowledge is worthy of transmission. And I will transmit that, right? So already, it's, it's a, it's a non-hegemonic sort of role that you're playing as a homeschool, yeah. as a homeschooler. Also, as a home educator, you're creating, right, the education that your child receives. So you're saying, okay, this is important to me. This subject is important to learn. Not because this subject is going to teach me that I'm superior or inferior, but this subject is important because it's part of transforming the self, right? Producing a self that understands itself in this world, not as a spectator, not as a victim, but as an as a agent of change that has agency and that has capacity to make transformative action and make transformative changes in this world. That is the potential of homeschooling, is that it can radically create a, a different kind of subject, a subject that doesn't know itself as an economic subject, who, know, who doesn't know its only purpose in life as, you know, being related to the economic system, but rather a subject that understands itself in relation to a higher purpose, mm -hmm. right? In relation to justice, transforming structures of inequality and oppression. But not only that, the homeschooling uh, potential comes in that it can recenter knowledges that, or ways of knowing, sorry, not just knowledges, ways of knowing that have been sort of seen as inferior because of this uh, idea that West is best, right? Mm. This idea of West is best has meant that we want to send our schools to Western schools because we think the Western education is the best education. Yes. But what's an, what ends up happening is that our children, they're, they're, they are disconnected from a Quranic epistemology, the way of knowing the world. Quran, the Quran comes with a particular way of knowing the world, mm. right? It comes with its definitions of success, its definitions of purpose, its definitions of what is the good life, right? What is a flourishing life? And you can't get that through a secular education, but you can, of course, if you supplement that at home, after the kids come home from school, on the weekends, and so on and so forth. But a homeschooling context allows you to take that to the next level and sort of center the Quran and Sunnah as a way of um, producing a particular kind of subject. Mm. And where does secularism fit in here? So one of the arguments made by uh, the proponents of, uh, and, and many of the uh, journalists who, who argued in favor of uh, the, the verdict, the Michaela verdict, suggested that um, these are secular schools. And um, if you want to send your child to a Muslim school, then you have the right to do so. Um, and uh, the pupil who... Uh, went to Michaela, uh, which is a very high-performing school, knew very well, and the parents knew very well that this school was um, a, a secular institution. Um, how do you understand the use of the word secularism here in, in the verdict and in, in the conversations that I've had, and since, had since the verdict? That's a great question, and it's an important question because it allows us to touch back to an earlier conversation we had mm. in which you asked me, how are we following this, the French trajectory, mm -hmm. right? And in the French context, secularism is sort of the prevailing discourse that justifies the management of Muslim populations. So the way I understand secularism is through the work of Sabah Mahmoud, and you must be familiar with her work, and I'm sure many of you list, your listeners are. Yeah. Um, Sabah Mahmoud, she sort of, uh, she dismisses the idea that secularism is the separation of church and state. She right. says secularism is not that, it never was that, and it never will be that, right? She says secularism in practice, historically and contemporarily, what it is, is the management of religion by the state. The state doesn't take a bad seat here. It doesn't extract itself from the religious life of its, uh, its national subjects, right? It actively intervenes in them as a way of managing religious difference, as a way of managing religious populations, mm -hmm. right? So secularism, again, not separation of church and state, but it's the act of management of religion and the act of management of populations. So we see that here in the Michaela verdict, right? Yeah. By arguing that schools are secular, the verdict is essentially managing, right, how religious difference is expressed. Yeah. It's managing how young people understand the role of their the role of their religious practice in the public yeah. so it's very much about managing it maintaining it and controlling it 
than anything else. If you encourage homeschooling, for example, if you uh, uh, suggest to parents that they've got to balance, uh, even if they can't, if they're not mobile enough to maybe uh, homeschool their, their children, but uh, they need to balance the curriculum with a strong sense of Islamic morality and history and ethics, um, isn't there a danger that uh, Muslim, uh, young Muslims will uh, exhibit s separatism or exhibit uh, tendencies which uh, prevent them from integrating into wider society? I and mean, I note that in France, uh, there has been a, uh, you know, a, uh, a discussion about Muslim separatism. There was a separatism bill, which I, I know you've, you've spoken about in, in the past. Um, how do we uh, appreciate and understand those fears that may exist? Wow, another great question. I think it's a question that needs to be put on the table and discussed because it is sort of the knee-jerk reaction that we get when we say, okay, look, homeschool is a viable option to um, what schools are doing to our children, mm. right? So I guess what we need to challenge is what is the impact of homeschooling on Muslim pupils? The way that it's being understood at the moment is that it leads to um, social regression, that it's going to lead to these young people who will just sort of create these ethnic enclaves. They won't integrate in society. They won't want anything to do with Britishness. They won't feel a part of, you know, belonging. But I would contest that. And I would say, look, what exactly is homeschooling education doing to these young people, right? What it's doing, and if we go back to our earlier conversation on what a white curriculum does, is that it simply mitigates against young people learning that they have no history, that they have no culture, that they are people who have no literature, language, and contribution, that they've made no contribution to society. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what you have are young people who understand that they are all of those things, and therefore they are contributors to culture, civilization, history, math, so on and so forth. Learning, having a strong sense of your history, your past, and your contribution doesn't mean that you will necessarily become a supremacist of your culture, right? Mm -hmm. It simply means that you have been strengthened, you've been made into a subject that is confident in your history for the purposes of a particular future, which is orienting yourself towards participating in your society as a, as a national subject, as, as a citizen, not just upholding the dominant narratives or the dominant policies of your nation, mm -hmm. but again, participating as a change maker, participating in a way that holds you know, policymakers, legislators to account for their policies and legislation. So we're essentially trying to create a subject that doesn't imagine him or herself as an economic subject, but an actor of change that lives purposefully, that lives this life with a particular purpose. And I don't think schools can, are necessarily imparting that sense of purpose because again, Education has been so inextricably linked with uh, employment and economic purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So I would challenge this idea that homeschooling leads to the social regression. I think, and I see this in my own son, not to toot my own horn, mm -hmm. but I mean, he is a confident boy. He understands that he might be a Muslim boy, but that doesn't mean that he is inferior, uncivilized. That doesn't mean that he has nothing to he has nothing to contribute in the future to British society. I was in Turkey for a, a few months, uh, a couple of years back, and I noticed that there was a growing number of Westerners who were moving to Muslim countries, Turkey, the Gulf states. And uh, it, most of them, a lot of them, when I ask them why, why have you moved here, they would suggest it's because of their kids and, and the state of their kids in, in the West. And, and some of them remark that... Um, in the West, you've got to be constantly on alert and you're, you, you just don't have the bandwidth to deal with the multiple issues that come your way. Whereas, you know, there are challenges certainly in the Muslim world, but you, you tend not to have those sorts of concerns when it comes to, to, to your children. I mean, do you feel that there is really any future? I mean, it sounds like a, a radical, radical comment, any future for, uh, for Muslims here in the West? I mean, is, is the writing on the wall and are we all really going to be moving back to Muslim countries? You know, I think this idea that 
it will be easier to raise our children in Muslim majority countries is sort of this romantic idea of what Muslim majority countries are, right? Yeah. yeah. And we know that these Muslim majority countries um, are post colonial states. In other words, they have gone through brutal histories and have brutally experienced Western, Western European, or sorry, the European colonial project, right? And the European colonial project wasn't simply, you know, extraction of resources. It wasn't just enslavement, displacement of people. It was also an epistemological project. It was a project of transporting, exporting, and embedding Western thoughts around the world, right? That's why Western literature is read in India, right? We read uh, Western literature in India. Um, so Western thought is, has been transported across the world. And with the fall of the Ottoman Empire, a lot of this Muslim majority states that came, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, the, the Muslim majority states that formed in the wake of the fall of the Ottoman Empire underwent reforms in which modernization was equated with westernization. And so you have these Muslim majority states that are not necessarily in their essence or at their heart founded on, again, I say like a Tawhidic metaphysics or a Tawhidic worldview, right? Mm -hmm. Again, drawing in this Quranic epistemology, this Sunnah-based epistemology, understanding what the world is from the Quran and Sunnah, and then also um, sort of nurturing values that emerge from those um, perspectives. That is, that is a society that doesn't exist. Will it exist? I don't know. Did it ever exist? I don't know either. But the point is, it doesn't exist at the moment in these majority countries that imagine that this exists. So I think going there doesn't necessarily mean we're going to radically sort of give our children a different kind of education. Yeah. And by now you know what my version of a good education is. It's rooted in this Tahidic paradigm. And so I think instead of imagining that the solution is outside of us in a different land yeah. where we need to get up and leave, I think we need to seriously think about how our community centers, mm -hmm. our mosques, our madrasas, our Sunday schools, whatever Muslim institution, whatever, whatever educational institution that we sort of run in this country, how can we begin to do some of that work that we want and are done? These, yeah. sorry, and are these conversations taking place from, your, yeah. from where you're sitting? Do you see uh, mosques and communities and madrasas and education is coming together mm -hmm. and discussing and talking about um, uh, all of what you've just mentioned, uh, your analysis, as well as um, how we uh, recenter mm -hmm. the lives of Muslims in this Tawhidic um, uh, sense. Sure. I think there is conversation happening in academia. Mm -hmm. And I have myself been a part of some workshops and some academic uh, discussions that raise the importance, or talk about the importance of doing this kind of education. Right. But now the next step is to take that outside of these academic spaces into the, the spaces of practice where educational practice actually happens in these sort of secondary um, institutions of education like mosques, mother says, and so forth. Um, we need to bring that there. I'm sure that those who are currently running these institutions are there because they have a sense that this is what needs to be done, right? They're there because they see that there's some inadequacies in the current education system, yeah. right? And so I don't think it'll require a lot of work to bring them on board because they're already there. They just need a bit, perhaps, the vocabulary um, to ground what they're doing so that they're a bit certain about their, their, their approach. And I think we, need to, we definitely need some kind of social intervention that is systematic, that brings this notion of education to the community and helps them sort of put that into practice. But I think ultimately, you know, what needs to be centered is a Quranic education, right? A Quranic education, but it has to be done differently. It cannot just be about memorizing the Quran, reading it quickly, cover to cover. It really has to be about uh, diving its meanings, doing the dabur, teaching children that the Quran is a book that you think about and you ask questions, you ask it questions, you ask it, what is God telling me in this particular verse for the particular moment that I'm living, right? We need to train young people to see the Quran as a living document, right? That speaks to them, that is speaking to them all the time, in any time and context, right? In any time and space. And once we, we do that, I think we will have a powerful 
a powerful educational sort of strategy, right? When we center the Quran. Again, centering the Quran doesn't mean that we neglect knowledge of math, science, geography. Those are fundamental as well. But at the moment, we've taken out the Quran and we've, we've done a great disservice to our notion of education. You cannot have education without the Quran. The Quran gives you the life, gives your heart's life, right? It gives a life life. Without the Quran, our life is not living, it's death, right? So centering, just being very clear that our education has to center the Quran is the first step. And then coming up with strategies to do that, building the curriculum material, material training the teachers, creating that ethos in our institutions. And then of course, bringing in all the other sciences, but creating that holistic Islamic education. That is what I think we need to be working towards. Dr. Amina, in, in recent weeks, we've seen uh, a lot of controversy surrounding Muslim students who are talking about uh, what's happening in Palestine, the repression of Palest uh, Palestinians in Gaza. We've seen uh, a similar uh, situation in the United States where um, there's a, a general consensus amongst the educational elites that um, uh, Palestine and Gaza are are off limits and we can't have those conversations and certainly can't have activists uh, who are uh, contributing to, the, to the, the discussion about genocide and ethnic cleansing in, uh, in educational institutes, even in, at universities. Um, how, do, how does one um, understand what's happening over Palestine within your, your general analysis? Well, I have two ways to interpret this. Mm. The first way connects to a conversation we had earlier which is that schools in the UK uphold supremacy. Yeah. And with the repression of Palestine solidarity, what schools are doing is nothing more than upholding white supremacy. What do I mean by that? What is Palestine solidarity? Palestine solidarity is essentially political activism that comes with a radical claim, which is that Muslim life is valuable, that Muslim life matters, that Palestinian life matters, that Palestinian life doesn't just matter, but it deserves the same rights that any other right that, uh, that any other human deserves, right? The rights to sovereignty, the rights to security, food, water, safety, and so on and so forth, right? What Palestine solidarity is demonstrating or exposing is that you have an international humanitarian legal order that has limitations now, right? Where Palestine is on the edge of this juridical order, this international juridical order. And when you have a limit or an edge to any kind of system, what happens to the Palestinian life that is there at the edges of this order, that are not included in this order, that is not sort of protected by its provisions and its guarantees? What happens is that these people are stripped of their personhood, they're stripped of their political personhood. And for young people who are going to school, showing Palestine solidarity, or in higher education, young people who are being silenced, who are being doxxed, who are being shadow banned, who are being so on and so forth for their Palestine solidarity, solidarity, what is happening is that they learn a very nefarious lesson. It is that there is no guarantee, there is no international system that guarantees Muslim political subjecthood. There is, no international sub there is no international order that is going to pretend or protect and defend Muslim personhood, legal personhood. The implications of this are very grave. The implications is that Muslim life can be bombed, can be droned, can be tortured, it can be displaced, it can be um, extradited, detained without charge, it can be subjected to a full arsenal of you know, violent, uh, of state violence, right? Now, what Muslim people then are learning, or young, young Muslim people, is that Muslim life is killable life, right? It's a saleable life, and it's assaultable life. And this has implications for Muslim women, right? In my research, young Muslim women, after any kind of media spectacle involving Muslim, such as, in my research, it was the Christchurch massacre, it was the denationalization of Shamina Begum. These young women were very scared to enter the public domain. They were scared to walk in front of their houses. They were scared to go to school. They would hear, for example, the crackle of a water bottle and fear that they would be having acid thrown upon them, right? 
what you have is a case where Muslim women feel that they are assailable life, right? They feel that they are the next vis victims of some racial violence on the street. When you have a population that fears for its safety in this way, you have a population that is not able to live fully and realize its potential, right? Because when women don't have that kind of, I mean, feminists have been saying this for a long time, when women's security and women's mobility is not guaranteed, then you have an entire population or a segment of the population that is essentially crippled and cannot you know, live fully. And for us, Muslim women in our community, they hold a very important role. We are the foundation of a, a community in the sense that we, we, we transmit knowledge, we nurture children. Of course, men are doing that as well, and men should be doing that as well. But we have a special role within that, right? And when women are not able to move about freely in society or they're not able to sort of feel, feel safety, then that is taught to their children in terms of how they ought to feel about their place in society in turn. So I think it's very important to, to take into account the impacts that something like the repression of solidarity in schools for Palestine has on your bodily safety and how you imagine yourself as being secure in a society. Dr. Amina Sharif, it's really been a fascinating conversation. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for this great discussion. Thank yeah. you. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.